we the meeting has now been recorded. That was close. Uh, that was close. I almost forgot to push record. Uh, but the meeting has now been recorded. And uh, hello to everybody that's joining us. If this happens to be your first one, uh, then hi, I'm Brian from Headstrong. And it is lovely to, to speak to you and lovely to have you here. As I say at the beginning of all of these sessions, uh, I'm not going to do a big introduction because that's already been done and it would take up loads of time because, I mean, I've got such an amazing and fascinating and, quite frankly, inspiring story. No, I don't actually. But, I mean, if, if you want to hear who I am and why it is that I'm here, then you can actually look back onto the, the very first session uh, that we did last Monday and all of the sessions, uh, including the one that we are just starting just now, uh, which will be up on the Scottish Aquaculture and Innovation Centre YouTube uh, later on today. And uh, all the other four are all already up there, so they're all on the YouTube channel uh, if you want to watch them and tune in whether you want just a wee recap on something or whether maybe you didn't hear them the first time and you want to catch up. So um, we are we are in number five, we're nearly there. I've got my cup of tea as always. It's probably too hot to drink, but I'm going to try it anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's just about there. And um, what I'm going to do for the next half hour is take you through yet another uh, concept of the mind. We, we've been through and we've talked about a, a, a lot of things uh, since we began. In the first session, uh, we talked about how thoughts cause feelings uh, and how feelings don't just happen to us, that they, they need a meaning. There's a meaning attached to our outside world inside our heads. And in the second session, uh, we talked a little bit about how that all happens. Like, how does that actually work? Um, how does the bubble, as I call it, how does the bubble get formed and how it, it changes things as we're going through our lives and changes how we see things by ignoring things, by bending certain bits of reality to make it fit our own belief systems, and then by making assumptions and generalizations. In session three, we talked about how all that was made through memories and how everything like stacks up and how our lifetimes are just a lifetime of experiences that all become us. And then in the last session on Monday, we spoke about motivation and how all of that comes together to then create these, these feelings, these values inside us, that we want and we chase and we pursue and that also drive us from the back. These things we call values like security, connection, respect, trust, happiness, love perhaps, all of these different things that drive us to be the people that we are. Now, what all of that does right, is that all of that comes together to make you. Uh, all of these different building blocks from all of your experiences that then create your values and how your values then fit into this thought process that attaches meanings to things. You know, if you're, as we said the other day, you know, if you're somebody who really values security, uh, I'm going to guess that actually some of you maybe are, but not maybe as, as, as stringent. Otherwise, you'd be working for an insurance company for 20 years and doing the same thing every day. But if you're somebody who massively values security, if I was to say, you know, I've got a job opportunity for you, um, now I can't guarantee how long it's going to go on for at the moment. The project might be six months, but then it might be six years. We're not too sure how funding's going to go. So this might be your life, by the way. I, I, I don't know. Is this the life of an aquaculture scientist? Is this how it goes? Is, hmm, funding. It might be there. It might not be there. Why don't we see what happens? And it might all disappear tomorrow. But while it's here, let's enjoy it while it happens. For somebody with a big high need for security, that's a horrible place to be. <laughs> that's like, no, they attribute massive pain to that. But then if I was to say something like, well, uh, but if you were to do this work, look at the amazing things that you could create, the difference that you could make, or uh, the, the incredible discoveries that could be made in your certain field and your passion, whatever that might be, and you might be like, oh, and then what happens in your head is you weigh this pleasure and pain up and this is where your feelings come from and how we behave. But as all that comes together, as I was saying, what it does is, is that it creates patterns. And one of the things that I hear from people about mental health all the time is, is that people have a million problems. This might be you. Uh, you, you might be sitting there at the moment going, that's totally me. That is totally me. I have one million problems. Uh, and I, honestly, they just keep on coming. More and more problems. I'm like, ah, under all my problems. Oh my God, what am I going to do under all these problems? 
I'm going to tell you right now, that's actually not how your brain works at all. Your brain doesn't have the capacity to have lots of problems. Because actually, one of the things that I'm going to say to you is, your brain is actually supremely lazy. Now, we've hinted at this as we've come through uh, the previous four lessons, but I've never really explicitly talked about what I actually mean by a lazy brain. What is a lazy brain, after all? Now, a lazy brain is basically what it sounds like. This thing in here, this, this machine in here that controls all your thoughts. Now, to get into it, and I know that some of you are going to be far, far better biologists, and maybe actually you've studied neurology or something like that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what you know. But ultimately, it does sound super cheesy, but it is true to say that actually you have neurons all over your body. So albeit that you're a thinking machine, it's still your brain, though, that controls most of it. It's like your, your central hub. It's like your, your main center, like your HQ uh, is in here. Yes, you have enough neurons in your gut to create a cat's brain, apparently, round about, somewhere about there. You could create a cat's brain out of the neurons that are actually in your gut. And they're important. Uh, and all of your neurons are massively important. But HQ still controls them. And HQ will decide where they go and can overrule certain things uh, when it needs to as well. You might have a mad, a mad urge, for instance, to um, punch one of your colleagues. <laughs> I don't know why I chose that as an option as, a, as my, my example, but you may have a mad urge to punch one of your colleagues, but HQ will go, not a sensible idea, Jemima. Uh, and I don't know who Jemima is. If any of you are called Jemima, I now feel as if I have to look. I, I don't know if any of you are called Jemima. If you are, anyway. You get my point. So HQ in here is massively important and it doesn't have the capacity to have a million problems. It is hugely energy hungry, massively energy hungry. Around about 70% of the water that you intake in a day is used by your brain just to keep itself moving and keep itself squidgy uh, and to keep all those thoughts going and to try and work out what's going to happen next in your favorite box set and to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow and to think about what you're going to have for dinner this thing here is just massively energy hungry now therefore that makes it lazy now some people especially quite often i must admit more scientific people say well no no my brain's not lazy my brain's efficient hmm. it's actually massively inefficient i must admit in terms of the way that it uses itself, it's one of the most inefficient styles of, or inefficient machines that we know of. And why? Well, like I did to you very early on, if I ask you to imagine eating lemon right now, inefficiently, it will start to make your mouth water. If the lemon doesn't work, as I always say, you can use pineapple, mango, chilies. Think about your favorite dinner. Think about having a big slice of pizza just now or your favorite coffee. Or think about sitting in a beer garden, having a nice beer. Any of those things and you find your mouth will water and you'll get certain emotions and feelings. That's not efficient. That's just trigger and response. That's what that is. Also, we could argue that an efficient machine, if our brains were efficient, that we would get to a point at some point very early in our lives where we would look at ourselves in the mirror one day and we'd go, hmm, my current dietary intake seems to be exceeding my output of calories and energy. Therefore, what it seems as if at the moment is that I am putting on weight. Therefore, my efficient brain is going to say, stop eating Jaffa cakes, and I'm going to stop eating Jaffa cakes and then I'm going to go back to an optimum size, whatever that might mean. But that's not what we do. We sit there munching into Jaffa cakes and eating full, <coughs> full packets of Maltesers. And we sit there, I mean, I'm not suggesting that this happened, uh, watching a, a really poor substitute for Univision, huge fan, love it, uh, on Saturday night, drink a full bottle of wine while trying to make it entertaining, uh, kind of enjoying it, but kind of not, while also realizing that when you put your hand in your bag of whisper bites, that actually you've eaten all of them too. That's not efficient. That's a massive waste of time. But why do I do it? And why do you do it? Why do you follow all these? And why do I say that it's a lazy brain? Because your lazy brain wants to do the least amount of thinking that it can. To be efficient actually requires quite a lot of thinking. And we've talked about efficiency when we talk about values, for instance. An efficient mind would look at his values and go, this is what I want from life. I'm going to go and get it. But that takes hard work. And therefore, what's easier? Well, what's easier is just to live a life of patterns. And that's actually what we do. 
the wee thing I put onto the holding slide, which I actually forgot to put on the holding slide and put the last one up uh, by mistake earlier on, it was, are you normal? Now, normal has got massive inverted commas. And I don't mean, are you normal in terms of what society believes is normal? What I'm going to tell you is that for you, whoever you are, you have a life that is defined by patterns. And these patterns are what I call your normal. What is your normal? And I'm going to bet that at the moment, many of you have gone, what is normal these days? You know, nothing's normal at the moment. And you'd be entirely and completely right. One of the challenges that's been happening for a lot of people uh, during this lockdown period, day 60 today, uh, apparently, and day 60 of lockdown, um, that what's been happening is that the normal is all gone. Normal has changed. Normal has disappeared. Uh, everything that we considered normal is gone. And even though um, at, at the moment the supermarkets are starting to stock up, remember at the beginning when normal was that you couldn't even get pasta in the shop, you know, normal was no toilet paper, random, but uh, maybe you were one of those toilet paper people. Maybe you can explain because uh, the rest of us have got no idea. Um, but uh, we hope that you're still enjoying your toilet paper stock wh wherever you are holding it at the moment. So these, uh, the, the, the normal that you, you live by has gone. Now, if you like, we could imagine normal happening on two levels. We have what I'm going to call our big normals, and then we have our little normals. And interestingly, these are quite often more important. Now, your big normals are the things that you have learned that just are. So things like um, a big normal would be, for instance, if you're someone that has a faith and whatever religion or faith that you follow, and, and it will have normals, it will have routines. It, you will have learned these routines, by the way, since you were tiny. This is basically what life is. Life is learning what the normal is so that you can make decisions off it using the values that you have. So if you have a faith, for instance, then you, know, you go to synagogue or you go to church or uh, you go to mosque or whatever it is, Friday prayers, Sunday mass, wh whatever it is for you. And, and, and you go along and this is what it is. A, a different type of faith, if you like, is a love of sport, for instance. So if all of a sudden the football stops, then what happens is you start to lose your normal because these are big normals. You know, every Saturday or Sunday afternoon, I go and I meet my brother, he comes and picks me up, and then the next week I pick him up. And this was a routine to the, to the point where actually everything stayed in my car so that everything was in the car. So we had like, uh, I, I'd, I'd had this normal, like during the day, we'd get a couple of bottles of water just for the drive back home again. Uh, the, the scarf would be there, the hat and the gloves would be there in case I need them, hand warmers, it's Scotland, I'm sure you are very sympathetic to that. We had a routine and then poof, that big normal disappears. You know, if you were to think just now about what your big normals are, I wonder what they would be. These big patterns that you normally follow in life. Work, by the way, will be one of them. One of the challenges for many people, I don't know if you guys are finding this, is that this isn't normal. I've been confined to this little room now for 60 days. My wife won't let me out. I live here. No, I don't live here. I'm only joking. But I've been in this little room for, for 60 days delivering to this little dot just in the top of my screen here. And that's what I've seen. I've, as I keep on calling it recently, I've been shouting into a cave uh, where uh, as I shout out uh, uh, to, to you guys, I can't see any responses or reactions. Quite rightly, by the way, I would recommend, just in case you show up on the recording, that you, you leave your cameras off. And that's okay. I've grown used to that. But I don't know if you've found that it's much harder work. You're having to work. The energy that needs to go into it is a little bit different than you normally use because it's not normal. It's not part of the usual routine. My brain doesn't already have sets of routines that says this is how we handle this. This is one of the challenges as well for many businesses. And to give them a little, bit of, a little bit of a break, a little bit of sympathy, also a lot of the politicians. When we say that this is unprecedented, what we basically mean is we have no normal for it. Now, you could argue that we probably should have had and all of this, you know, maybe somebody should have, uh, you know, been, been prepped for this type of thing happening. It's been hinted at enough and Hollywood has made a million movies about it. Maybe we should have been ready. But do you know what? We weren't and therefore we're making it up. So 
Ultimately, our normals and our big normals are things like work, the big routines like faith, your relationship, for instance, will have changed all of these little things. But we also have our little normals. And our little normals, I tweaked both there, but our little normals, the ones that sit down here, actually are the ones that a lot of you might not even realize that you're feeling at the moment. They might be the, the little effect that it's having on your mental health at the moment without even realizing. What are the little normals? They're the things that we don't even notice. You see, our big normals are easy to notice. We can almost rationalize the fact that, you know, we can't go to football. Or I was speaking to my mum the other day, uh, and um, my mum, I, I, just, I just asked, I've got to admit, I, I don't go to church anymore. My, my religious affiliation is, is very, very loose, uh, indeed, if any at all. But my mum is still a, a, has a very strong faith and, and she loves it. And, and I love the fact that she loves it and she gets so much out of it. And that's, it, it's brilliant for her. And um, I, I, I was saying to her, what's happening with mass at the moment? What's happening with church services? So she was telling me about how her and my, my aunt, my uncle, who she's currently staying with, so she's not on her own, um, that they stand and they, they watch uh, mass being beamed live from churches. And she was actually saying that recently she's like, well, and it's good because I, I did mass from Ireland the other day and then I've done mass from the Vatican and I've done mass from here. And, and actually in some ways now she's quite enjoying the fact that she's getting to see all these different churches uh, doing these different church services. Now, she obviously still misses the sense of community and that's where we get into your small normals. You see, the little normals are the ones that, as I say, we don't notice. We can rationalize everything else. We can get that in our heads. In fact, as my mum did, we can even make a, a, a positive uh, out of it, you know? But it's the little ones. It's that lack of community. It's the fact that when you went into work, the little conversations that you used to have just across the desk about whatever you watched on television last night. It's the hello that you get from the person in reception when you walk into an office, if you happen to work in one. It's going to the canteen and sitting there and having a conversation with someone, uh, even about a bottle of water or having a little laugh or just saying to the, the person who works in your canteen, are you okay? Or the roll shop or whatever it is. It's about not getting on the train and seeing all the people that you're used to. It's, not, it's about not having sometimes that little time yourself that you didn't even realize that you had. For instance, you know, another wee story for you. Uh, in November last year, I crashed my car. It, it, I mean, obviously, it wasn't my fault. I mean, the guy that was stopped in front of me definitely shouldn't have been there. I mean, I probably should have had my eyes on the road and not looking at the accident on the other side of the road that he was also looking at. But still, I mean, who when we apportion blame... I know I went into the back of him, but no, it was totally my fault. I should have been paying attention. But I've not had a car now for six months. And I, I, moved, I moved my wife's car the other day just out of the driveway. And I, and I flipped it out of the driveway and just moved it around so my daughter could get her car out. And do you know what? Her radio came on. And just for 30 seconds, after 60 days of lockdown, and therefore, because I can't drive pretty much, go out for a walk every so often and all these types of things, and sitting in this wee room speaking to this wee dot in my, my computer screen, the radio came on and it was just me in the car, but it was different from me in here. It was like almost the feeling that nobody could get to me, you know, that, that feeling like, and that was one of my little normals. I loved driving. I listened to podcasts and audiobooks. It was my time. It was like, I drove lots. I, I used to do like a really high mileage um, because just the, the nature of the job. And it was just that little normal that I missed. I wonder what your little normals are. What are the little normals that you're missing at the moment? But let me flip it. Because the thing about little normals, and any normal in fact, the thing about any normal is, is that we tend to ignore it. The fact is that it becomes a normal. It becomes like this pattern. You know, like it becomes like a rhythm. If you imagine like a click track or a, a metronome or something like that, if you ever get to see me do a talk on this live, by the way, I play a really annoying noise at the moment. <laughs> uh, like right from the very beginning, in fact, it would have been right from the beginning, there's this just annoying dink, 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 dink noise comes out. But I'm going to imagine that many of you would have thought that your computers would be broken if that started to happen. Uh, or you'd just switch off. Uh, you can't get out when I've got you in a room. But it's like this click track, this, this rhythm to your life that happens. And when this rhythm happens to your life, we stop noticing it. 
You stop realizing that it's even important. Think about the number of things you didn't realize that you'd miss until now you're missing them. Even though maybe you even sat there and went, oh, that does my head in. But actually, now that, you're me- now that it's not there, you're actually missing it a little bit. Even though that visit to your relatives or the in-laws, for instance, used to go, oh God, again, every Sunday we have to go there and, oh, I hate that. Now actually you're like, do you know what? I'd love it because you never really noticed what it was giving you before. Think about your house. Think about, in fact, your life in general. And you know, you're surrounded by little normals that actually are eating energy. And this is my, the reason for talking about normal. Now tomorrow, or sorry, tomorrow, Friday, for the last of our sessions uh, in this block uh, anyway, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about how to change that. We're going to ch- talk about what it is that we can do to change our normal and, and how to make sure that that normal sticks and that, that it, when it changes, it changes really, really well. But when you think about normal, um, it's eating energy. Think about, I am going to guarantee that somewhere in your house, definitely somewhere in your life at the moment, you have something that you ignore. And something that actually, you remember we talked about the bubble and how we ignore? And I said at that point that we ignore anything that we become used to. Anything that becomes a normal will end up being ignored. What's yours? Like, do you ignore, like, I'm going to keep it simple and then I might get my pokey stick out, by the way, just so you can prepare yourself. If you've never heard of the pokey stick before, then don't worry, you'll know when it arrives. <clears throat> so, like, maybe it's like that peeling bit of wallpaper or the fact that, uh, you know, you've wanted to tidy out, you know, that drawer of stuff. It's just got things in it. It's the drawer where you put things when you don't, want to, when you don't know where else to put it. And it's now got to a point where you go, I wonder what's in there. And you keep thinking, I'm going to tidy that out. Maybe it's the fact that you've got a wardrobe of clothes that you no longer wear. And actually, one of the normals can be for many people is that when that is you, when you have a wardrobe of clothes that you no longer wear, that actually you stress yourself out in the morning with a bit of decision fatigue by trying to work out what it is that you're going to wear. Maybe your normal that you've not changed is that there's something actually in your life emotionally that you've not dealt with that you've not changed, an action that you've not taken, a thing that you've not done. What's the normal that you're ignoring? What I want to do is, today, is I'm going to set you a little bit of homework. You have 48 hours, slightly short of that. We could say 47 and a half, because I'm going to start at half past 11 on Friday as normal. So you've got kind of 47 and a half hours. And what I want you to do is, at least one, is change one of those normals. Deal with it. Go and do whatever it is that needs done. I I know that you think I am exclusively yours, but I've actually been talking to quite a few companies. I was talking to a company about this uh, last week and I got a phone call from a a gentleman uh, through that company. And uh, he was speaking to me about kind of a lot of things that we'd been talking about, but he said, do you know what I did? He's like, I listened to your talk on the normal thing. And I was driving my car down the road and my car's had a scratch on it for the last, I think he said it was like ages. He's he's had a scratch for something like five months, six months. And he told me when it happened and it happened in a supermarket and all sorts of stuff. So it was this scratch in the paintwork. And he's like, do you know what? I found myself sitting uh, and I had some time to waste. And he's like, I found myself about to go on my phone. And I thought, no, hang on. Do you know what I'm going to do? And he put his car into the local garage and the guy said, oh yeah, I can fix that for you right here. He's like, it did cost him 80 pounds right enough to, to get it fixed. He's like, do you know what, Brian? See the the feeling of just having that fixed and just that momentum that happens when you start to change your normals. See, the thing is about normal is that the way that the world works is that our normal becomes sometimes a reality. It's easy to ignore the things, as I said, that we get used to. It's easy to sometimes ignore reality because you kind of think, well, that's just normal. That's just who I am or that's just what I do. Pokey stick time. It's pokey stick time. Uh, Just so you can prepare yourself. You know, this is just who I am. This is just what I do. This is just the way it is. But it doesn't have to be. If your big normal, if one of your normals is, is that you find that you and your partner are fighting all the time, do something about it. Why are you being so stuck in your normal to think that that's normal? 
I'm not saying that when you go out there into the into the world that the, the, your prince or princess is sitting there just waiting for you going, oh, I was wondering when you'd show up. Let's go fall in love. I'm not saying like that. But what I'm saying is, is that sometimes the best thing that we can ever do about a normal is challenge it. One of the real benefits of everything that's been happening recently that everybody keeps talking about is I hope that actually some of the normals that have been changed stay changed. I've got to admit, I, I'm loving, I, I'd imagine many of you doing the jobs that you do will be the same. Um, I, I'm loving the fact that, you know, you, you're seeing these pictures of, uh, of things like the, the dolphins in Venice and the fact that when we see the maps of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide and all the other and sulfur dioxide emissions from the big cities in the world, that, that they're looking much, much, much more flat and none of those big black spots. I'm loving the fact that I'd imagine for any of you interested that I'm sure that you could probably tell me what's happening at the moment to fish stocks and to various things around the world in terms of how the seas and the oceans are responding to what's going on at the moment. I know it's not all butterflies and rainbows, but there's some good stuff that's happened as the world is shut down. But you know what? It's dead easy just to go back to a normal again, isn't it? As one of the things I actually read uh, this morning was that they're expecting potentially that as lockdown starts to get lifted, that actually uh, CO2 levels may spike because more people will want to go somewhere in their cars because they've not been able to. And we might have big traffic jams and all sorts of stuff. But even when it comes to your life, what are the normals that you would love to stay changed? And what are the normals that at the moment you're ignoring? If you paid attention to them, even though that would take effort and you'd have to convince your lazy brain to do it, would make a massive change in your life and free up some energy. Now, on Friday, I'm going to tell you how to do that. And what we're going to do on Friday is I'm going to talk to you about what I call the three normal mistakes. So the three things that people do that basically they think they're going to change and they think, this is it. I'm going to make a big commitment to myself. Everything's going to change right now. And they're going to do this thing and then what happens is normal just comes back in again and says, nah, nah, do you know what, I, I'm, I'm back. And the three things that actually can make massive transformations in your life. And I'm going to say, you already know how to do, how to do one of them um, already. So we spoke about it on Monday. You want to go and check out that video. I think in summary for today, what I'm trying to get you to understand is to step back and notice that, as I said at the beginning, when people say that they've got a million mental health problems, very rarely do they. You normally have one or two mental health problems. Now that might mean that because of the way that normal works is it shows up in lots of different places, but everything has a pattern. Your relationships, your career, your life, your mental health, your physical health, the way that you eat, the way that you work, the things that you love to do, all of these things are patterned. That doesn't make you really boring, can I just say. It just makes you normal. This is how life works. And as a last wee thing for you, just because it's popped into my head and I've got one whole minute left, if you ever find that life is passing by at 500 miles an hour, you know that way where sometimes you go, is that a year gone already? 2020 is counted out of this, can I say? At least the first half of it is counted out of this conversation. But you know, if you ever look back and you go, how have I got to here and what's happened? The reason that that happens is because our lives become stuck in normal. And as I said, your life ignores normal. So when you basically do, very mild swear word coming up, when you basically do same shit different day, what basically happens is, is that your mind just goes, and it doesn't pay attention. There's nothing there for it to pay attention to, nothing to break the pattern. So Monday blends into Tuesday, which blends into Friday, which then the weekend disappears because you're just doing the same things again and again and again. And if you love security, that's absolutely fine. But if you ever want to slow down time, the best advice I can give you is to do something that's not normal. Thank you very much again for joining us today. Um, and I hope that you're enjoying these sessions. Uh, as I have said, all of the sessions are going up onto the SAIC uh, YouTube channel. And if you don't know where that is, uh, then just Google it, Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre YouTube, uh, and it will pop up. 
uh, not a problem for you because nowhere else it's called the Scottish Agriculture Innovation Centre. So therefore, it's not the most difficult one to find, I must admit. Uh, this one will be up there probably in the next uh, couple of hours or so. Uh, and uh, I will see you on Friday where we talk about how to change your life. And I'm going to tell you how Tea in the Park changed my life forever. Can't wait for that. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody. And I'll see you all on Friday if you can make it. See you all later. Bye.